Alrighty, folks, welcome back to the Mushing Alaska's coverage of the 2023 Iditarod. We are your hosts, Brendan and Sean. And uh, just do me a favor real quick, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe. Do that. We love it. This thing's growing. We love that it's growing. We're having fun doing this. We want to talk more about the Iditarod. So let's do it, Sean. What do you got to say, man? I got to first and foremost, Brennan, thank our sponsors. Uh, this episode is brought to you by PBR. Here at PBR, it's not just about shitty beer. No. It's about bringing one brother and another brother. And this is this is a cheers, Brennan. So, you know, this, this is about family. It's like Fast and Furious 10 that's coming out. It's about family, right? And it's also about the rod. And we just had two days, and I don't want to quote. I want to quote my good friend Chad Stoddard. Top 10, I did a rod finisher. Rookie of the year and most improved musher. The last two days that I did a rod, it was a, it was a hot rod. It was a real hot rod. And now it's cooling down. And we're stoked it's cooling down. And here's to that. I'm so sorry. All right. Uh, oh, oh, you ever have just a long day, Brennan? I mean, we are recording this at 1.15 in the morning. Eastern, <laughs> Eastern Standard Time. Oh, he's like playing the world's smallest violin. For, for his, dude, it's already 9.12 here. All right. So it's pretty late for me, actually. Uh, okay. All right. We're gonna, wait, wait. I did a ride. Okay, so there's a race going on. It's a thousand miles, and right now we're about halfway in. Okay, look, this race has been fast. I want to shout out to the back of the pack for kind of pe- keeping up pretty well with a pretty aggressive uh, front of the pack. You know, like you can't be too too far back. You have to stay within the rhythm of the race, <laughs> and that's a rule in this race. Is is kind of have to there's no exact time you need to get to the finish line but you know if you have a year where it's super slow trails they'll be okay you can have a slower race right but if people are going really fast and you know there's only 33 mushers in the field you there's not a whole lot of room to spread out that field right so those folks that are in the back of the pack they kind of have a little added pressure uh to them like like if you were in a race that had 50 or 60 mushers and you're back where greg vitello is he's sitting he's been not not even i don't think he's even in last place right but then you only have 33 mushers in and i don't think he's he's not running like the craziest of slow races it's just that's a pretty fast race and you're seeing signs of uh you know these our experienced mushers, Brent is, Brent is, he knows what he's doing, and he came out of Ofer, out of his 24-hour rest. He just rested for 24 hours, and he stops after halfway to Iditarod, which is like 35 miles, right? What are we at? 432, 352, yeah, that is a an 80-mile run, according to the gps tracker so he stopped at 40 miles pretty short run to come after 24 stopped for about two hours so and relatively short rest and then continue on to iditarod and he did something that i can't remember brendan the last time that i saw but brent says stopped at a checkpoint at a checkpoint not for a mandatory rest no 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 out of his own free will. It's a beautiful thing. So he's banking some rest. He knows we're only 500 miles into this thing, dude. Wow. I'm, glad, been I'm, glad, riv- I'm glad we didn't make Go a ahead. bet on that. I'm glad I didn't bet on that. I would have bet that he's not stopping at any checkpoints like he like he did last year, except for the Mandos. Yes, exactly what he been, did last year. and Would have been money lost. Several years. But it was, look, the only person that was at the checkpoint was Wade. That was 24, so... And, you know, it's it's also a pretty quiet checkpoint. I think it uh, makes sense. 
Um, so you can see, I feel like Brent's like, all right, he's kind of thinking, all right, man, it's not important to be in first place. I just need to keep my dog, run the dog, run your own race. He tattooed it on his arm. So he's thinking like, what should I do? I don't know. And then he just looks at his arm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Run my own race. And he's run running that race. his own race. And you're going to see Brent and Jesse. They're kind of in staggered schedules right now. So you're going to constantly see this first and second, first and second. However, we're seeing the chase pack. We're seeing the homies start to show up. And look at Deal, Richie Deal. Pete Kaiser, by the way, they're best friends, right? They're right next to each other. They live, they live just uh, down the Kuskokwim River from one another. And they are in third and fourth place. Ryan Reddington's right behind them, and they're all three running on similar schedules, so they're going to stop within a few miles of each other and rest uh, you know, a similar amount of time. And then you kind of have the chasing pack that's chasing the chasing pack. And that would be Kelly Maxner, Eddie Burke, Matt Failer, and Nick Petit. And um, look, just want to shout out the rookie of the year race, right? It's clearly it's between Eddie Burke and Hunter Keefe. And Hunter Keefe, I've been complimenting him a bunch. He works for the Reddingtons. He's running Reddington Dogs. He's been he's learned from them so he had a pretty fast start like you see from most reddington mushers and so you see maybe connor keith is this is this is a sign of a mature musher taking seeing the signs taking a little extra rest right making the adjustments before it's a problem seeing that it could be a problem in a, in a day or two and seeing like all right we got 500 miles keep the team strong right so you I love seeing these mushers making these adjustments, adding a little extra rest. Maybe you could say they started the race a little fast, or you could just say uh, this is part of the plan. doesn't matter, but they're making these adjustments, and I like to see it. Um, <clears throat> so we got a good, good chunk of mushers at Iditarod Checkpoint, which, by the way, I'd like to talk about this, Brennan, and feel free to chime in and interrupt me at any time. Yeah, I'm going to interrupt you pretty... real quick. Yeah, Just go ahead. Out of, you threw it out there. I'm like, I, I, why would me. I not cut you off? Yeah, um, please cut me off. So just wanted to point out a couple things. I've been working on uh, adding to the image of what we're looking at. So uh, you should see this red line. That's now something I've added into. It's the route that kind of shows love things. red lines. Red lines, whatever. And then I haven't added every single musher into this uh, map, but this is what you have so far. And uh, by the next time we record, I'll have all the mushers in here. And this is probably, this is up to date as of about 15 minutes ago. So this isn't like a live tracker. I've got to like actually go to the, the GPS and move things around. So just, uh, you know, thought I would point that out, try to make this a little bit more interactive. We don't want to just like rip off the Iditarod's GPS. So I figured that we would take the extra step and do this for you guys. So I just thought I would point that out real quick. Sean, you can take it away. Um, would you mind zooming out for me? Zoom out? Absolutely. Let me, uh, if we do that though, I want to take the mushers off. So you see where the mushers were. Mm -hmm. Look how much trail we got left. Look at this. Yeah. Do you guys see the Yukon River? Why don't you point out the Yukon River for them? Yukon River being this bad boy right here. Oh yeah, that's a big old river. Oh, and you big old river. This thing flows across the entire state of Alaska into the Yukon Territory. So that's all of this right here. They call it the mighty Yukon. How many checkpoints, Brennan, are on the Yukon Anvic. River? You got the Anvik, one. Grayling, two. Eagle Island, three. Caltag, four. And that's where I got in making the route so far. But then love, it my, love you, dude. Then it heads over here to Unilaclee. So 
Yeah, you've got these one, two, three, and four right on the Yukon. I'm glad that that's exactly where you got because, firstly, I've got a number of points, but the first point is that coming up on the Yukon River, one of those four checkpoints, every musher is required to take one eight-hour rest. And this is something, if you're watching this and you're like, kind of just figuring things out and you're not really sure what the hell is this idea about thing right and people are like so yeah there's mandatory rest on the trail there's a 24 hour rest there's an eight hour rest on the yukon river right you can take the 24 hour rest anywhere you want but it's it's usually over to Kana mcgrath and then there's the final eight hour mandatory up in white mountain brendan He's 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 gonna drag that map over to White Mountain, and that's the last kind of the last legit checkpoint. Safety is just there to as a place to get out of some weather, but it's not really a proper checkpoint. Um, but that accounts for like I don't know, like a quarter of the total rest these guys are taking. So it, the reason I don't talk about mandatory rest that much is because it implies that's only the only rest the dogs get. Look, they're resting all over the trail. Okay, uh, the uh, I'm excited to talk about that run from Caltech to Unicleat in two days, but I'm going to filter that out. And I want to go back to Iditarod, where you might be wondering, if you're a casual Iditarod fan, what? There's a checkpoint named Iditarod? Like, isn't that the name of the race? I'm very confused. Well, this is how I've heard it been compared. The Oregon Trail. Guess what? That trail goes across the entire country. But it's named after the destination. The Iditarod Trail goes a lot more places than Iditarod goes and is named after the destination. So Iditarod was a massive gold mining town in the 1920s and 19-teens. And the trail was how people, mail, supplies got to this town. They went from that direction, the coast, where Brennan's pointing out, and they also came from the east and south down near Willow. Uh, some came from Fairbanks, some came from Nenana. And all these trails came from all over the state, really, and they all converged here in Iditarod. And now Iditarod, uh, once, once you, you, know what, you know what they say about the gold rushes, it's like, by the time you hear that there's a gold rush and you need to go and like get to the gold rush, it's probably already over. They found all the gold. That's the same with Iditarod. This pretty big town of like a thousand or plus people popped up and now it's just a, a, a ghost town that they built a shelter cabin for the Iditarod for the mushers to sleep in after taking some great naps in there. Um, so, yes. Back to the race. Brennan, start talking. Bam. So, uh, there he is. Great yes. job with the map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Listen, I, it's just a work in progress. Can I, I just got to point this out, guys. Like, everything that we're doing here is so very much trial and error. So, you know, starting to get some more comfortable with some more things. All right. Then we start adding a couple new things. So, um, yeah, uh, but you were telling me that you were talking to a couple of friends today, and I thought that you you said something about you wanted to share something that you were talking about. Yeah, well, and I've talked to I, every time I see a friend that's run or I did or ride or mushed at all, really, but I always want their opinion on what do they see in the I did or ride. Like when you hear Sebastian Schnull's take, you're like, Jesus Christ, I am not gathering even two percent of the information that he's gathering from the iditarod website while i was hanging out with tim pappas and Ch chad stoddard both iditarod veterans multi iditarod finishes um and they both when i asked separately with they both mentioned pete kaiser and look i've been trying to look at whatever they're seeing and i can't really exactly find it but they are convinced that Pete Kaiser is the the ultimate threat right now. We got a def he's a Iditarod champion, and his run times are great. And by the way, the run times from this run 
from my Diderod to Shagaluk, which I've never been on that section of trail, is if you look at the topographical aspect of the map, is rather hilly. And then I went on to research the description of the run, and yeah, lots of hills. Uh, it's a 65 mile run, and it is. Uh, a, you can plan on a minimum of seven hours if you did it straight, uh, and even as much as 10 hours because the people that live in the village of Shagaluk never go to Iditarod except for putting in the trail for the race on the southern years, right? There's a southern route and a northern route. This year's the southern route. And when you leave Ofer, you either turn left to Iditarod or right towards Ruby when it, on the northern years. So no one actually is going to be going to Iditarod except for, for the race and for their other events that are on this trail. So the trail is usually pretty soft, but I'm seeing some... So when you look at the run speeds, you see like these wild variations of run speeds when you're looking at the GPS tracker because <clears throat> you go uphill five or six miles an hour and you go downhill eight to nine to ten miles an hour depending on how steep the hill is. So Ryan Reddington is going 9.2, Brent Sass 8.9. Uh, and then you got Eddie Burke who is the chasing the chase pack that's chasing the chasing pack. He is running 6.6. Kelly Maxner, 6.8. Uh, Matt Failer, 7.8. Nick Petit, 7.8. So these guys are clearly a little bit slower section of trail when you see all these guys bunched together, all going one or two miles an hour slower than the people in front of them. So you can, ex and I remember watching this earlier today and seeing this chasing pack was having the same thing going on. Um, shout out to Katie Joe Dieter, uh, who is, let's see, she last year, she had an unfortunate ending to her race where there was heroic winds of 70 to 80 mile an hour gusts literally blowing her sled off the trail. Um, and she needed to assistance uh, for the dogs to uh, to get to a shelter cabin. And then once the wet wind died down, they actually ended up mushing all the way to Nome and crossing the finish line, I say in quotations, because because she got that assistance from the snow machines, it was, she was disqualified from the race, but still completed the entire trail. You know, when you when you get disqualified, you do not get that belt buckle. You don't get to technically say that you finished the Iditarod. You know, it's kind of nice to have that. And uh, KJ Dieter's back at it the next year. And like I said, this is a fast race. And I don't, my, I talked to Jeff before the race. Jeff Dieter is her uh, other half. And he was, you know, just trying to get to the finish line. But she's like way ahead of the back of the pack. And so she's she's running, I what I've from what I'm perceiving to be the best race that she uh, could be running, and and I'm really impressed with where she's at right now. And um, I just want to constantly try and make an intention to watch the back half of this race. We're always wondering about who's going to win, and I want to continue to hammer in what Sebastian said on this podcast is what is winning to you, right? It's a lot of these guys get to the finish line, run the dogs at the maximum efficiency of that. I'm going to disappear for training. a second, but you keep talking. Okay. Okay. And I want to go to this remind, this takes me to Riley Dyke, Riley Dyke. I watched his interview. This man is running a team, uh, mostly composed of two year olds. We have a few one-year-old yearlings in this team uh, and, and then a few veterans as well. So this is a pretty exceptionally young team. And he is coming in to Iditarod and he's in the, you know, right around the top 15. And he's got, you know, based on his interview uh, and his speeds and his schedule, he seems to be... Um, 
having a pretty strong team considering how young they are. And that's really, uh, it's pretty impressive to have a team mostly of two-year-old dogs never seen the trail. Right? If you're competing in this race, look at the front of the pack right now. So every person that's in the top 10, Brent Sass, Richie Deal, Jesse Holmes, Ryan Reddington, Pete Kaiser, Jesse Burke, Kelly Maxner, Nick Petit, Failure, they've all seen, all their dogs have all seen the Iditarod Trail before. They know, that, and it only takes one time, I'm telling you, it only takes one time for the dogs to remember the trail. And now you got Riley out there with these all these younglings that they've never seen a trail before, and he's keeping up kind of with that front of the pack. Um, shout out to Moa, Porsid, uh, Christian Turner, Dan Caduce are doing great. Um, I haven't kind of delved too deeply into what their schedule is. Uh, but yeah, I think that what we're seeing right now in the front of the pack is that this chasing pack is a lot closer than they were 100 miles ago. So that everyone's come out of the 24, right? Everybody is on the same time. Beforehand, there was that slight, you know, oh, so-and-so started 40 minutes after, you know, the first musher did. Well, now we have the 24-hour. Everything you're seeing, the positions of all the mushers, that's what it truly is. And right now, as I speak, Richie Deal's patching Jesse Holmes, who's resting on the trail. I'm thinking Jesse Holmes, who's ra resting right in between Iditarod and Shagaluk, is going to push to Anvik, where he may take his eight-hour, or... He may just take a regular four hour to rest, like you, you typically see with these front runners. And, um, you know, I think this is, you might see, you know, these front five mushers are a lot closer. Uh, I mean, obviously, we're going to see Richie Deal, Pete Kaiser, and Ryan Reddington are going to probably stop in Shagaluk because they started their run from Iditarod. Uh, and so when they stop in Shagaluk, Jesse Holmes is going to start running again, and he's going to run through Shagaluk to Anvik, right? So, Brennan's back, thank God. I'm back, baby. So, <laughs> so you're going to see a lot of hopscotch again. It's going to be kind of hard to tell like who's really in the lead, I think Brent Sass and Jesse Holmes still have a, a little bit of a lead over Je uh, Richie Deal, Pete Kaiser, and Ryan Reddington, um, but the gap seems to be a little smaller. And uh, even though you're going to see Richie Deal, Pete Kaiser, and Ryan Reddington probably pass Brent, uh, pass Jesse, you're going to see Jesse pass them back here in a second. So it's kind of you're going to see a lot of this hopscotching. It's interesting to see how it's going to formulate as we start to approach the Yukon River um, and get to that eight-hour rest, and that's going to play a huge part in the strategy is that eight-hour rest. You have to take it. Where are you going to take it? What time of the day are you going to take it? What are the temperatures doing? Um, all these factors the mushers are thinking about. You got. I hope you guys are, Iditarod, are already on the Iditarod website and have paid for your subscription because there's got some incredible interviews. We watched this really sick, candid conversation between Bailey Vitello and Jason Mackey and Jed if, Stevenson. If anyone if anyone is listening that is working for the yeah, Iditarod, which probably they're not listening, but there needs to be more of those type of videos. I was just, I just love the candid conversation of Jason sitting around in the, I guess it's like a hospitality tent, or I'm not sure exactly what you call it, but he's just sitting there, I'd assume drinking some coffee, and Bailey Vitello's there, looks like maybe there's some volunteer workers there as well, and it's just like behind the scenes conversation that really interested me, um, and you know, you and I were talking about it like, Jason's kind of talking about how fast the race is. It's like, you know, he he's more used to like the shorter runs and the shorter runs with the shorter rests. He's not used to seeing consistent, you know, 
runs that are seven and eight hours doing that consistently throughout the race. So I think that I want need more of those videos, but I really enjoyed listening to that and getting that. Like that usually, cool. usually it's like someone's asking questions, right? Usually Liz is right. asking a question or whatever it may be, but that was just like, he was just talking and having a conversation. It was really, I don't know. I didn't really enjoy it. I also would like to shout out to Bridget Watkins, who every single interview she's ever been in is she's just as happy as can be with an incredibly positive attitude. And uh, she's also, look, I coming from someone who's been in the middle of the pack, like, and I've honestly, if we're going to be real, probably close to the back of the pack. But Bridget Watkins is running, again, similar to Katie Joe Dieter, uh, a pretty damn good race. She's well ahead of that back of the pack. And, you know, I think I want to say, Brennan, you're going to check me on this maybe? Here we go, here we go. That what what did she do in the race last year? I want to say she was also stuck with Katie Joe Dieter on at the end of the race and ended up not being able to finish. Stand by. So, stand by. Yeah, prepare to stand by. So she's running a great race. Um, you know, Jesse Royer and Mike Williams Jr. A lot of people going into this might have ex- going into this race might have expected them to be a little bit more competitive. But Jesse Royer at the start line, she did say she got. 13 dogs out of the 14 that have never seen the trail. So can't be too surprised that she's a little bit farther back. So uh, she's coming back to Bridget Watkins. Yeah. Dude, she got all the back. Way, she got all the way to White Mountain. Yes. So she was in the same storm as Katie Joe Dieter. And there's a third musher that was in that same storm and i believe it was gerhardt so those are the three mushers that are some pretty epic stories a cinderella story of mushers that came all the way 900 and plus miles into this race and they had to scratch and i tell you what i've also done that and it's not fun and they're back in it the next year and we got, we're rooting for him. So you're rooting for them. That's official. Guys, Absolutely. you guys are rooting for him. Absolutely. Right? White uh, Mountain. Jesse Roy- just, White Mountain. Just, this is, just so they know, ahead. White Mountain is 921 miles into the race. So, you know, you're effectively yeah. 96% of the way there. It's got to be, it. got to be tough. And I know that you feel, feel them on that too. Absolutely. You, you spend all year. All year, just thinking about the series of situations that led you into, in their case, 80 mile an hour winds in the middle of the Topcock Hills, trying to get to a shelter cabin, and they literally would pull their beaver mitts out of the sled and off into the wind they go, gone forever. And it was like, this is, you know, hurricane force winds that they were dealing with. So I don't think even the best of mushers, you know, that are did around champions in those storms, you would see them probably having a scratch as well. Um, so yeah, you know, Mike Williams Jr. has to run an I did a a few times, but dude, this guy's going on the track for 10 miles an hour. Strong ass team. And maybe he's going downhill right now, let's be real, but that's pretty good speed. <laughs> and hey, I bet so- you- Go ahead. Dude, I'm I'm surprised we haven't gone here, but we gotta talk fancy mushing. Like Dude, please God, let's do it. Come on. Let's just hit this. <laughs> let's not go too far down the hole. Let's keep this on the short end of things. But all right, all right, all right, all right. I'm just saying I personally I'm feeling pretty good about my team right now. <clears throat> you know? Uh you know, I'm looking at my my, my lineup here and I'm just you know, maybe you guys could leave a comment or something uh, in in the uh, in the video. But come on, dude, I got Wade Mars killing it. I got Jesse Holmes possibly winning it. I got Eddie Burke Jr. Rookie of the Year. 
I got Matt Thaler. He's gonna he's he's getting his first top ten finish. I got Riley Dyke. I I'm I'm he's gonna he's gonna sneaky Joe himself back into the top ten. We got Matt Hall. He might do the same thing. And I had to pick, I had to pick my boy Jed Stevenson, man. And my let boy me just, Jed, dude. Let me just talk to you for a second, man. Jed I Stevenson. Jed. I I watched a, one of the insider videos on him today. I love this guy. I just he he was talking about like uh, the kid, his kids, like do do the mushing with him, and you know he's. I don't know. He just a, sounds like a super fun, loving, down to earth guy, and I had to pick him. Like, in order to make all the money work for fantasy mushing, you had to pick like a lower, a lower level priced person. And I was like, I like Jed. I like his vibe. I, I was looking at some pictures before the race, uh, and when I went to look at his his. Uh, his pictures on his Facebook. I was like, I think me and this guy vibe. So I just picked him based off of that. But anyways, like I said, we're not going to get too far down that rabbit hole. But I mean, that's a strong seven squad right there. Sean, what you got, dude? Dude, my team is trash. No, I'm just kidding. But also I'm not because I'm in like 728th place. You would think that, honestly, I think that what this yeah. means, Brendan, is that nobody should be listening to anything about my did route analysis because apparently I suck at fantasy mushing. Uh, so let's see, we got Brent Sass. Well, that's helpful. Aaron Peck, a little bit farther back than I would have hoped that he'd be. He's doing good. Miller Porsche is doing good. Kelly Max is doing good. I have Jen LeBar on my team. She's scratching Rainy Pass. And Riley Dyke uh, is doing, yeah, like I said, he's gonna he's on the come up. But... You know, I got the only muster that I didn't that I had to pull out, so you know, that's not for fantasy purposes. This is just for fantasy purposes. We love Jen. But that's that's a tough one. It's a tough one to pick. Nice. All right, so like I said, we're not gonna focus too much on that, but thought I'd have fun with that for just a second. And wait, 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 oh. wait, 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 wait. Whoa, excuse me. All right. Fantasy mushing. Can we break down what it is? Is that where you were going? Uh, I mean, we can talk about it for just a second. For just like a one minute. Just, okay. So Sean. basically, fantasy sports, we all understand fantasy sports. Ish, you know, you draft a team of different players all onto your team, and whoever has the best team of different players does the best. Same thing with this. You start with like a shit ton of gold doubloons or something, right? Just these gold coins. And each musher is valued based on, you know, their resume. Brent Sass is the most expensive. Jen Labar, who's a rookie, and she's the most affordable. Uh, so is Jed Stevenson. And so is Greg Vitello. And uh, you pick the best team that you possibly can with the coins that you're given. And then you see how they do, and you get points for their run times between checkpoints, the position that they arrive at each checkpoint, where they finish, of course, and a few other things that I don't remember. So next time there's a sled dog race in Alaska, they 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 have limited. It's run by Danny Seavey, who is Dallas Seavey's bro. So that's pretty sick, and uh, he's also an Iditarod veteran. And he is a busy guy, and so he can't do it for every single race. In a lot of races, there's not as enough mushers. But next year, fantasy mushing, you, I'm talking to you. You should be on the website. It's pretty sick. It's fun, man. It just gives a little something else to do, and you know, uh, in my like, in my case, I don't know everyone the way you do. And so I was just like, all right, this is like a fun way to, you know, follow other people, you know, maybe in my case, I only know some of the like people at the top of the pack. Right. But in figuring out who my team was, it made me like kind of do a little bit more. I didn't necessarily do research, but I kind of like just wanted to figure out who I like. So um, before we 
wrap this video up, I was going to ask you if you have anything that stands out to you that you're looking forward to in the next 24 hours of the race. Look, it's, it's, it's a, a section of trail that can be really slow. And I think it's kind of cool. It's exciting for all these villages, Shagaluk, Anvik, and Grayling. They all are in, uh, have people living in them. And, you know, they only get to have their race come by every other year. So I think it's going to be cool. We, yeah, I want to give a shout out to Brent Sass and Richie Deal. You know, you saw that awesome video of them giving their condolences to the late, uh, the widow of the guy that I wish I knew his name and I'm so sorry I don't, but he was ran the, uh, the Nikolai checkpoint. He literally was the mayor and the post, you know, the postman and the, you know, everything, every job that there was for this village. He at one point had it. Jack, you're not getting to go on the bed. My dog wants to go on the bed. That means it's time for us to almost sign off. So yeah. Uh, we, I'm excited to see some of the interactions with the mushers and the people that live in the villages because that's what this thing's all about. It's community, bringing people together. Look, you guys are watching. If it wasn't for this race and for my and Brennan's incredibly, uh, you know, incredible personalities, we wouldn't be here, you know. So it's exciting to see that community happen. All right. All right, Sean. Well, are you, are you inspired? Yeah, man. This has been a fun, a uh, fun little segment to record, and I hope that you all are enjoying. And uh, you know, if you if you like what what we're doing, leave us a comment. You know, we'd love to interact with you all. If you have any specific questions, we'd love to break that down even more. So, until the next one, y'all have yeah. A good and one. look, oh. uh, also, just from my last thought. Uh, PBR did not sponsor us. But if they want to talk about it, we're down to talk about it.